Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Hello and welcome to the end of series special. I'll be back soon with a whole new series. But coming up in this episode, I'll be taking a look back at Rabbit Software, a story with a shock ending. I review the Comcon joystick interface. I check out some game endings. And generally taking a sideways step away from the usual format, as I tend to do for the end of series episodes. So, let's get on. Rabbit Software started producing Spectrum games around November 1983, but had been publishing games for the Commodore 64 and VIC-20 for some time, having come into existence in 1982. Set up by Heather Lamont and Alan Savage as an offshoot of a computer company in Harrow, their move to the Spectrum was a brave decision, especially with the masses of other games now flooding the market. The company received many games from eager programmers, most written in BASIC, and most not up to scratch. If the game was thought to be good enough though, Rabbit helped them compile them into machine code and sold them as part of their range. They came into the news when director Alan Savage got fed up with a distribution deal. Rabbit had the franchise to distribute an American company's games within the UK, but many of them had bugs and proved useless. Despite this, the company, Victory Software, still demanded payment. Unable to sell the games due to the bugs, Alan instead decided to simply give them back. He hired a van, filled it with 4,000 faulty Vic games, drove down to London and dumped the whole lot in front of the company's solicitors. I like the sound of this guy. In a feature in Crash Magazine from February 1984, Rabbit said they were looking forward to a long life in the software industry. It is tremendously sad then to find out what their fate was not long after that interview. Let's start with their games, many of them conversions from the VIC-20. I'll be looking at these games in order they were released, based on the product codes. The company put out two distinctive cover designs, the early ones with hand-drawn covers and little in the way of company logo, and the later ones with a red top banner and better artwork. I have a mixture of these styles, but at least have a full set of games, many of which are arcade clones. Coming first was Escape MCP. Taking ideas from the film Tron, you find yourself trapped inside your Z80 processor and have to escape. To do this you have to get to the MCP and disable it on the 10th level. To do this you first need to find the MCP path. The game is a simple maze affair with a single large chasing enemy that although is meant to look like the ships from Tron looks more like a letter M. It tracks your movement around the maze and you have to first get the key and then get to the exit. You can collect the floppy disk if you want for extra points. If you get to the exit you are treated with a rendition of the Star Wars music and the next level begins. The screen layout consists of a maze drawn in flashing blocks, which is really bad on your eyes. The chasing robot moves smoothly, but your character runs in 8 pixel blocks. The trick is to lure the robot towards you and then dash off to get the key or to reach the exit. Sound consists of a few standard beeps, but this was an early game. Later levels have vanishing walls too as an additional challenge. And the final level, if you can get there, reveals the Tron influence. There is no grand finale, it just loops back to level 1. The next game was Paratroopers, and this was a version of the 1982 PC game of the same name, which in turn was a copy of the 1981 Apple II game Sabotage. This simple game is very addictive. You have to stop the paratroopers landing by shooting their parachutes or by shooting them. You can also take out the helicopters that drop them down. You swivel around quite nicely and the gameplay is fast and frantic. The graphics are basic but do the job and sound is okay for an early 16k attempt. The aim is to get a high score by surviving longer, nothing more, 
and this is the strength of the game. It's simple and easy to play, addictive and fun. From a copy of an Apple game to a copy of an arcade game and Pakakuda. Although you can't tell from the inlay what type of game this is, as soon as it starts you know it's a Pac-Man clone. It's even got the Pac-Man start tune. The gameplay is the same as the arcade. You run, or in the case of this game story, swim around eating things. Your pal pills have been swapped for electric eels that allow you to eat the chasing monsters for a short period of time. You can move from side to side across the screen using the tunnel, and there are also bonus items that pop up, like cherries. No idea what cherries are doing underwater though. The graphics are character based, and apart from your Pac-Man cross fish thing, are not animated. Sound is limited to a start tune and the items that you eat. There is nothing that stands out about this game. It's playable for a few games, and it does give you three levels of difficulty, but that just makes the game faster and more or less impossible. At the end of the day, it's just another Pac-Man clone, like 90% of the others that appeared around the same time. With games coding in its early days, I suspect Race Fun, which is the next game, was an attempt to give the player something like pole position. The 3D was obviously impossible back then, so the author opted for an overhead view. The gameplay has also subtly changed. And you have to go as far as you can on the limited fuel. If you slow down or hit anything, you lose fuel, and so lose points. The faster you go, the more points you get, so it's a trade-off. The road moves down the screen in character jumps, and starts off straight, but soon begins to narrow and twist left and right. The narrow sections usually mean it's impossible to overtake, too. The graphics are large and chunky, with 8 pixel movement, but control limits the gameplay. You can only press one key at a time, so for example, you can't accelerate and move left, and this often causes you to crash and lose points. The game is fun to play, with some average sound, and trying to beat your previous score makes it quite addictive. Sadly, there were many similar games to this available at the time, some even in magazine type-ins. Still with the arcade clones and the next game took us away from the driver's seat and into a shooting gallery. Quackers is obviously a clone of the arcade game Carnival, although it does not have a few additional parts, and it has some omissions. As the game starts you get rows of ducks, rabbits and I presume black cats, but I'm not entirely sure. Above them are green smiley faces and a scrolling wall. The idea is to shoot all of the targets before the timer runs down, and that is a fairly difficult task. Unlike the arcade version, there is no limit to the number of shots you have. Instead, you can happily blast away as much as you like. Once all of the items are clear, you then get to shoot a turtle for some reason. He runs across the screen and when you hit him, he changes direction, and you have to keep doing this to avoid him running off the screen. The inlay says if you keep him running long enough, you win a super prize, but I never actually managed to get that far, but it is a good place to get some points. The graphics are a bit basic, but scroll smoothly enough, and sound is used to good effect. There's no carnival music like the arcade, but this is a 16k spectrum game. From one arcade clone to another, and centropods. This is obviously a clone of centipede. This version gives us most of the arcade elements too, and plays well. The graphics are drawn nicely and move well enough. The spider is there, and so is the flea, so we nearly have the complete set. The sound is a bit bland though, using basic beeps, but it does the job I suppose. 
Vertical movement is done by holding down the left and right keys, and this moves the player up, releasing the keys and the player floats back down again. Very awkward, and certainly different from the arcade experience. The centipede always manages to reach the bottom too, no matter how good a player you are. At least it did in my games. Just like the others in the batch, it's not a bad version. Although not setting the game's world alight, the games were, for the period, average and playable, and it wasn't long before the next games arrived, in mid-1983. This is Fantasia, and although based on many of the shoot-em-ups in the arcades, I can't quite match this one. It follows the usual format of groups of aliens swarming about, and you have to destroy them. Once you destroy a set amount of the current attack wave, the next will arrive, meaning you will have more than one type at a time. Obviously, this means that things can get very tricky on later levels, as you can have four different attack waves at the same time. The graphics are adequate and move at a fair speed, and the control matches the speed, thankfully. There's an impressive amount going on on screen at times too, with very little slowdown. Sound is used well, with varying warbling effects for the attack waves, firing and explosions, plus an overused effect when your ship gets hit. This game feels like an arcade game, you know, one of those that wasn't famous, but sat there occasionally getting a run when the other machines were busy. It's not a bad shooter, and can be very challenging. Back to the arcade clones again, and this time not even a name change. Here we have Frogger, and there's no need to introduce the game. You have to get your frog to the holes at the top of the screen, avoiding the busy road and turtle infested river. You have a time limit to do this, so speed is of the essence. This game adds a maze of deadly walls between the road and river, so there's another obstacle to get past. The graphics are fine, and move smoothly enough, well, at least some of them do. The logs move in character squares, and the cars don't. Your frog, however, also moves in character jumps, which can be very tricky when trying to get across the road. Control is the thing that lets this game down. It's all too easy to keep your finger held down on a key for a fraction of a second too long, and your poor little froggy gets squished or drowned. This is not the worst Frogger clone by far, and Rabbit games seem to be improving with every release. Still with the arcades then, and the next game is Lancer Lords. Or if you break into the code and look at the save element, you will notice that it's called Joust. And this is obviously a clone of the arcade game of the same name. Riding on your mighty ostrich, and armed with a laser lance, you have to defeat the other knights. To do this, you have to collide with them, but be higher up the screen than them. Once killed, the knights leave an egg, which you then have to smash to completely get rid of them. Anyone familiar with the arcade game will know what to do. This means a lot of flapping to get yourself in the right position, and then charging in. This is not as easy as it sounds though, because there's inertia in this game, which makes controlling the player pretty difficult. As each level begins, the background changes, and the number and speed of opponents increase. I've never played this game in the arcades, and would be rubbish at it anyway, if my play here is anything to go by. This is quite a decent game once you get the hang of the controls. The graphics are nice and smooth, and there are some good sound effects. Things are looking up then. Still on with the clones then, and next we have Potty Painter better known in the arcades as Amidar. The premise is simple. Move around the defined blocks, filling in the edges as you go to get the scores. Chasing you are various things that will kill you if they catch you. It's a simple game that I never really saw the attraction of in the arcades, and this version does nothing to change that opinion. In fact, no version I've played will change my opinion. 
In this version you have a freeze key, which halts the chasers for a while, which is useful to get out of tight situations, but you can only use it three times per level. This replaces the arcade bounce button where the characters are bounced up in the air to delay them. If you complete the level, you get two bonus games. One, which to be honest I had no idea what was happening, involved a teddy bear dropping down some paths towards some bananas, and none of the keys I tried actually did anything. Then the game changes and you control a paint roller being chased by teddy bears. Here you have to collect the scores in the boxes before the timer runs out. If it does run out, the scores decrease until the blocks are worth nothing at all. Having checked the arcade version, this also happens. Well, you learn something every day, and full points to Rabbit for including them. Back to shoot 'em ups then for the next release, and Birds, which was later renamed as Bomber Birds. This game seems to take a huge step backwards for me, with jerky movement and poor gameplay, and this was a bit of a disappointment. I noticed that most of Rabbit's games, up until now, were written by John F. Kane, but this one doesn't have any credits at all. This game also reminds me of many typing games, and strangely enough, the soft tech game Firebirds, but that's a million times better than this. The aliens jump down the screen, accompanied by clicks, and you just have to line up your ship into the same character column and shoot. Some of the other aliens move about, and there seems to be a duck that flies across the top of the screen for some reason. I have no idea why they released this. It's below average even for the time it was released, and only worth a look if you want to laugh. The final game released in 1983 was Murder. This is a complete departure from arcade games, and a sideways jump into board games, in particular Cluedo. You play Chief Inspector Pincher of the Yard, and you have to deduct who the murderer was from the usual group of people, and you have to do this by moving around the house and asking them questions. This is a long-winded game, where you move from room to room and ask people a set of four questions. To move, you have to enter the room names to get to them, and you can't go direct, you have to move through adjacent rooms, which is a real pain. When you find someone, you can ask them a question, and keep notes as to who was lying, where they were, and what their excuses are. When you have done all this and interviewed all of the people, you can then accuse one of them of doing the dastardly deed. I always got it wrong, because I got bored of asking questions. The game then proceeded to tell me who the murderer was, and why. And then it crashed. Which was a bit of a relief, really. The murder, the murderer, and weapon are random each game, but this is really a bit of a boring thing to play through, unless of course you like this style of game. A bit of an odd one then to end 1983, and as 1984 arrived, the company looked to be thriving, but only released one game. Death Star obviously takes ideas from Star Wars. This game throws you into the trench scene, and uses some nice 3D effects to give the impression of hurtling to your death. Fighters zoom towards you and you have to shoot them, or dodge them. They sometimes fire back, so you have to be careful. This is another game written by John F. Kane, but in my opinion it's not as good as his previous work. It looks nice, but gameplay is a bit poor. The graphics do their job and the sound is average, but there's simply no gameplay in there. Most of the time it's luck whether you hit something or not, but sometimes you can get blown up without even seeing what hit you. the first game of the year out, things suddenly took a turn for the worst, and tragedy struck. In May 1984, while driving on the M10 in Buckinghamshire, Alan Savage was involved in an accident, crashing his Mercedes into a VW cab, which ended up upside down in a ditch. As arguments raised as to whose fault it was, Alan left the scene, later to be found hanged nearby with his own belt. He was only 36. 
fellow director, Heather, stated the company was doing fine and had no worries in that area, but staff were devastated. However, they vowed to continue. It was tough going and later the same month, Rabbit tried to reassure fans that they would continue despite the sad loss of one of the directors. Around the same time, they announced a new game, The Pit. This game, however, was never released. In July 1984, Heather put the company into voluntary liquidation, just 14 weeks after the accident. She claimed all debts had been paid, but since Alan's death, sales had slumped and the struggle was just now too much. Some reports claimed they owed over £1 million, but the actual debt was £220,000, with assets of £284,000. The majority of staff had found other jobs by now, and the company was just a shell, a shadow of what it used to be. Strangely, the following month in August, Rabbit announced a new game, coming soon, called Jolly Roger. Maybe a last ditch to try and trade themselves out of trouble, but it never worked. But remember that name though, we'll be coming back to it later. With the company still in trouble, rumours began to circulate that Virgin would be buying Rabbit software. These were denied though by Terry Grant, Rabbit's software director. Then, out of the blue, a game was released in 1985, called The Great Fire of London. Although this was sold under Rabbit label, the product code had changed from RSS, which was Rabbit Software, to VGR, obviously Virgin, but there had still not been any official announcement. The Great Fire of London is another move away from the popular arcade games, and moves more into strategy. The only problem with strategy games is that you usually need detailed instructions, and this game has very little. You control a chief person. No actual title or anything, just someone. And your task is to stop the Great Fire of London in four days. To do this you have to utilise three things. Water pumps, demolition gangs and gunpowder gangs. Each have their own effect on the surroundings. That is, if you can actually work out how to control them. You run around the huge map of London looking for one of them, when you find them you press fire, and when the icon lights up at the top of the screen they start to follow you. You can then drag them through the streets towards the fire. You can then leave them there, and then, well, nothing actually happens. I can see the idea, but for the life of me I can't get anything to work. I've read reviews, checked the inlay, and nothing actually states what you do to make them do their job. This game was released at a budget price too at 3 99 but even so, it seems odd that nothing seems to happen when you place water pumps or demolition teams anywhere near a fire. Following this release, there was a long period of silence from Rabbit until June 1985. News broke that Virgin planned to buy the company as previously rumoured, and in November they did just that, and prepared to re-release all the games in their back catalogue. Rabbit were no more, and yet another software company faded into history. A sad ending to a company that had been there from the very beginning, and although I can't say the games were fantastic, or that any of them, maybe with the exception of Paratroopers, were memorable, but some of the programmers responsible moved on to better things. John F. Kane, who wrote most of the games, later went on to give us Booty, Marble Madness Construction Set, and Thunderbirds. Remember that game, Jolly Roger, unreleased by Rabbit? That was written by John. It was set on a pirate ship and had you collecting treasure from different rooms whilst avoiding pirates. Sound familiar? More than likely, this was, of course, Booty, released in 1984 by Firebird, just after Rabbit went bust. Another unreleased Rabbit game, The Pit, had a description spookily like Exodus, another John Kane game. It is always sad to hear when a software company was lost, and even sadder when you consider the circumstances. The games of Rabbit Software live on though through emulation, and although you may not realise it, many games, not just the ones in this feature, have their own story to tell. There were many joystick interfaces for the Spectrum, some used their own protocols, others used the Sinclair or Kempston option. But the problem was, many games did not cater for all these different things. So what was a game player to do? 
The answer was to buy one of the few interfaces that you could customise yourself, like the ComCon interface, produced by Frell Limited in 1984 and originally costing $17.95. The box was larger than most other joystick interfaces. That's because inside lives a beast. The interface is huge, nearly half the size of the Spectrum itself, and is much heavier than, say, the Kempston interface. It has six leads coming out from the top of the unit, each with a symbol on them to say what it does. Left, right, up, down, and fire one and two. It has a nine-pin Atari-style joystick port, and sockets representing each key on the Spectrum's keyboard. It also has a pass-through port, strangely located on the top of the unit, meaning that anything you plug in will be faced down onto your Spectrum. That obviously means not all interfaces will fit. I tried my smart card, for example, and that just wouldn't work. I think from looking at it you can guess how it works. You plug it into your Spectrum, and to make the joystick operate as you want, you plug in the relevant lead. So, for example, you plug in the lead marked up into the relevant key socket that the game uses for that direction. And you do this for all required directions. And once you've done that, bingo! You're ready to play your game. You can also do this when the spectrum is on, which is an added bonus in case you get it wrong. It's fast and easy to set up, but you have to do it for each individual game. There's obviously no way to save or restore these. In operation, it works as you would expect. No hassles, no complex codes, no conversion tapes. It is literally plug and play. A good option then, for gamers wishing to cover all possible control methods. Picture the scene. You've been playing for hours, struggled through the adverse adversaries, fought your way past menacing menaces, and defeated the defeatables. And your reward? A bit of a letdown, I suspect. But if a game does come with an ending, and should you get there, this is the kind of thing you're likely to see. That's it. The programmer's personal message to you for buying his game, playing through to the end. Just a simple well done. Memory limits obviously meant it was not possible to have complex end sequences, and some programmers just didn't even bother with even a well-done message. But some went a bit further. I've been trawling through the RZX archives, watching a lot of footage, and it seems the game endings fit into six categories. Number one, none at all. Nothing, zilch. And the game just bumps you straight back to the start. Number two, the simple well done message, or just some text. For example, Ninja Hamsters. Number three, something is blown up. This lets the authors have some fun. So, planets explode, monsters explode, alien ships explode. As we can see here, this is Scumball, and the monster gets a mouth full of grenades. In Terrican, the alien city meets a fiery end. And of course, in Star Wars and Death Star Interceptor, the Death Star is blown into small pieces. Number 4. You win the girl. The game is usually about rescuing a girl. So the end sequence obviously completes the story. There are plenty of these games, probably more than any other ending I could find, other than the simple text message. Darkman gets his girl. So does Prince of Persia. The guy in navy moves.
nice dance moves. And even Monty Mole gets in on the action. Number five, plot or other ending. Here the plot, or other text, either brings the story full circle and ends it, or leaves you wondering what might happen next. These usually come as pictures, with some music, or static text. Sometimes you even get scrolling text too. Good examples of this include things like Space Gun, Saint Dragon, and Midnight Resistance, among others. And finally number six, novelty. Here we get random things like the famous firework display from Penetrator, or an escape via some other method like running away as seen in Factory Breakout, Of course, there's the classic Jet Set Willy gag. And a personal favourite, the weird Golden Axe ending, where the characters escape from the arcade machine and spend a night on the town. There's also Technician Ted getting his reward. And of course the Shower of Jelly Babies from Herbert's Dummy Run. These endings can't even be categorised by year, or company, or author, or even title. For example, Savage is a great looking game but has a very poor ending. So does Rambo, a big name release. Modern games have the luxury of memory and fast storage, and game endings are often long cinematic affairs with orchestrated music and rendered scenes. nice as that may be, it's well worth checking out some of the Spectrum endings. What, what I thought we could do for the, you know, the new section, the Let's Talk About section. What, what, we, don't, we don't even know what we're going to call it yet. Well, I, th I, th I think we should call it Let's Talk About. Let's Talk About dot dot dot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, what I thought we could do is each pick a game. So you pick one, you pick, you pick a game, I pick a game. So I was thinking you could you can pick some shoot mobs because I know you like shoot mobs for me, and I could pick some games that I like for you, and it would be interesting to see kind of the first impressions and, and as long as it's do. not jet set. B really. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I thought we could come up with that, and, and of course, what I said for the first one is we could talk about the spectrum itself. Okay. Good start, good start. It is. So when did you get your first spectrum? I think it was eighty three, early eighty three. And it was a 16K machine, because that's all I could afford. And I bought two games with it, which I, one was called Labyrinth and one was called Gobbleman by Arctic. I remember Gobbleman. It, cool. It's crap. <laughs> <laughs> My machine didn't work because I, I couldn't get through. It kept crashing. So they, they took it back and they exchanged it for a proper 48K model. Oh, that's cool. cool. At least you got a 48K model. But actually, the 16K is the only model I don't own. It wouldn't be a workhorse, so you wouldn't be able to, I mean, unless you played a lot of 16K games, it's not... No, I don't think I'd use it. You could use it for, um, you know, the ROMs, the little ROM cartridges. You could use it to play them, because they were all 16K, weren't they? I've, uh, I, I've actually had an idea that you could make a 
arcade machine out of one of those ROMs. You could put a jetpack ROM on a 16 or 40 AK Spectrum with the interface and things like that, and you could wire the controls into proper arcade controls and make a jetpack arcade machine. That'd be cool. Could easily have gone into the arcades, I think. I think I think it would have been a brilliant arcade game. We've gone off topic. Be- <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. Well, I think one of the one of the one of the reasons I thought it would be good to do this is that we could we can you can you you end it never goes as you think, does it? It, it well, never <laughs> it never ends up being you talk how you conversations very rarely go how you think they're going to go. <laughs> I got my Spectrum in eighty three. I got it for Christmas of eighty, and with it I got Spectral Panic and Attic Attack. And I was going to say, it changed my life. It probably changed my life for the next five or six years. But actually, I think we wouldn't be doing this if I hadn't got that then. If I'd never got a Spectrum, we wouldn't even be doing this. So I think it's... And you hear that story again and again and again all over, don't you? So you, you, you got Spectral Panic. Was that was that a PSS game? Or was that... You know what? I don't think it was any, any of the big publishers. I'll have to look it well, up and let you know, but... Uh, back on topic. Yep. <laughs> Where did you, uh, do you, did you actually find out where you got your Spectrum from? There was a supermarket chain called Fine Fair, and they had a electronic section, and my mum and dad bought it from there. And the reason I know that, and this is a confession, is I actually only had that first Spectrum for about six months, and then I broke it. Oh. And I've never admitted this <laughs> to anyone before. <laughs> <laughs> I broke it because I'd... I think I'd, the next game I got was Psst. Um, and I once started it, and I, for some reason, I started it with Kempston as the control method. And of course, you can't do anything then. And I remember looking at the back and thinking, well, you can get an interface that shoves in the back of there. I wonder if I like got some wire and tried to connect oh. those things together, whether it would, um, whether I'd be able to control Robbie the robot. I'll, I'll blow the house up. <laughs> Well, no, it, yeah, I. So you uh, selected a joystick control option when the when you didn't have a joystick. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, and I just told my mum and dad that it had uh, just stopped working. I didn't admit to that. <laughs> never, <laughs> never confessed to that. Um, so my mum took it back to the shop and got a replacement, and that I... replacement lasted about another three years, I think. And that just wore out. The P key stopped working. It didn't work anymore. One of the, after I've had mine for a while, the keyboard started playing up like yours did. And I went out and I bought a DKtronics keyboard from a shop called Spectrum. Mm. You probably remember there's got big adverts everywhere. And I and yeah. when I opened it up, I I was amazed that the keys didn't have any legends on them. They had they had little stickers with them that you had to put the stickers on. And I <laughs> I, I, I put the stickers on wrong. <laughs> Oops. And I took it back to the shop and said um, it was like this when I got it. Honest, Governor. <laughs> but yeah, I, I put all the stickers on wrong for some reason. I don't know, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> my, my, second, my second Spectrum, all the keywords wore off the keys. I played it that much. <laughs> that second one, of course. Yeah. What did you think of the Dead Flesh keyboard? Uh, I liked it. Only because I'd just come from a ZX81 and the it was a, a massive upgrade. And so to get what was the equivalent of real keys was it I, I i like it and i still like it now it's good to play on it's um it's good for gaming i think and i i actually back in the day i much preferred the keyboard to a um joystick oh yeah i still do I... It, well it depends what games you play so i've i've wired up a joypad for a spectrum before i used it as a joypad and night law and alien it i much prefer so when i came to record night law and alien it i was actually recording them off a real spectrum not a emulator at the time I I was trying to play with the keys. I was trying to play with a joystick. I'm like, oh, I'm I'm just gonna get a joypad. So I got an old PC one, and I I, I just re resoldered a lot of the um a lot of the connections so it would work as the D9 Atari standard joystick. Yeah, yeah. Here, here's a question for you. Do you know what the first game was that used QA, OP, and space as controls? I'm just thinking. The, the, at some point, somebody must have thought that's a, that's a good key combination, and and. It, it's because it's in a lot of games, isn't it? That's more or less the de facto oh, standard now. Yeah, yeah the, the, those were the four keys that went on your keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, and then Ultimate came I along don't, and b- balls it all up with Q W E R T. And what the hell was that about? Actually, the problem with that is if you play those games on some emulators, 
you can't because of the, I think the, because of the way the either the way the PC keyboard works or the emulator scans the keyboard, you can't press three keys together. Right. So if you're actually using QWERT to play an ultimate game, you'll find that you can't on Attic Attack. I don't think you can go diagonally and fire, for example. <laughs> the Spectrum <laughs> um, wins again. Yep. Yeah. As always. <laughs> As well as keys getting broken on Spectrums, the other thing that, that always broke was the power socket because she was always pulling it out and plugging it back in again. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I remember actually cutting cutting my power socket off and actually whittling it with a knife until I saw the connections and twisting the wires together and insulation taping it up to get you do, it working. You do like blowing things up, don't you? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't blow that. <laughs> Nothing blew up then. It wasn't plugged in when I cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> You're dangerous. Yeah, You're dangerous.